Okay, I've just started the recording. So in, in case if uh, you can't hear me well, I think in the recording it should be. Uh, so I don't have Maven installed here. So uh, let me install that. It's MVN, I think. So if I do MVN, so that should start building this application. Um, so I didn't try cloning. Uh, I just tried doing this whole thing from scratch on my instance and I've been fairly successful. I just have the last part to do it. Um, so that's kind of why I said I was fairly comfortable with what you walked us through last time. So but I wanted to ask you this. Mm -hmm. If I clone, do I get that entire uh, Ubuntu instance or no, no. do I get only the project instance? W what you would clone is just the, uh, the source code, right? Source code for yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm just it's cloning that particular yeah. folder. Yeah. So, so this, what you have here is just the source code. You know, I have... So before uploading this on GitHub, I I basically did a clean and then you know uh, uploaded the whole uh, directory, and then uh, whenever I I, I uh, update some code there, I make sure I just check in those files that I need. Whenever you update, you check it back. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I I I will do. I mean, you, you, if I clone this, if I make a change to the code. Uh, I'll do a commit and then I will do a push. So those are the things you need to do, right? So when you do a commit, you actually commit the code to your local repository. Mm -hmm. uh, that is wherever you're working. And then when you actually push, it actually uh, updates the repository on GitHub. Mm -hmm. and, and GitHub would be uh, the uh, golden source. Uh, you know, that, that's how you would want this to be. And if, if you look at the uh, Git architecture, right? So there is no uh, master, or you know, there is no uh, no copy. That. There's no concept of master copy and stuff like that. But you, by convention, no concept you, you, of what? There's no concept of a master copy. Like there is no uh, like all GitHub instances are the same. Okay. So the the one on uh, GitHub. All Git instances are the same. The one on GitHub, uh, since it's it's accessible by uh, you know the browser and all that, you, by convention you just say that's that's the golden copy, and uh, you you branch out within that if, you know, based on the kind of work you are doing. Then when you actually clone it uh, onto your local, you will get all the branches master and then any other branch that you may have development or bulk kit branches, whatever. And, and in this case, I only have you. Sorry. Uh, uh, the last two minutes. I uh, think your mic is really low on sensitivity. Um, okay. So, so, so when you, when you actually, uh, do a clone you will get a copy of all the branches on on the repository yeah i i, I know that uh, okay so so, so you okay so, uh, so uh, let's let's actually move ahead right so i only have master branch here on on this yeah. like I, I haven't branched out at all correct correct got yeah. it yeah okay. uh i am in the uh in the base folder of this and so it did compile and it says the build is successful so so what i did was basically 
MVN compile, right? So it only compiled and created the class files. Mm -hmm. And if I do MVN package, uh, this should create, okay, there's some issue here. Um, oh, not here. My, I'm on the wrong folder. So, so the way this project is set up, uh, you know, this is going to create an Uber jar, uh, which means it will uh, bring into the jar all the dependencies it needs, uh, including the Spark dependencies. So, uh, I have not installed Spark at all on this. I, I have not uh, unpacked Spark on this machine. Uh, but since I create an Uber jar, you know, uh, this is going to run the Spark code also because that will be a part of the jar file that gets created now. Is that because of all the include statements that you had earlier on in the uh, in the main? Uh, it's because I mean you brought in all the library references. Yeah. Uh, no, no. I include will still not bring in those dependent jars into the package. Uh, no, I don't mean include as an in include, but your reference uh, statements that you you asked us to put in at the beginning, reference to uh, Spark libraries. Uh, you mean in the in the POM file, right? The yeah. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. Okay. So if if you look at POM.xml, which is uh, the project object model, I guess, I guess that's what POM stands for. Hmm. Uh, so if so this is the yeah, so this basically describes the project. Yeah. So so here we are saying that the uh, Java that is used is 1.8 mm -hmm. and Scala is 211, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, and what makes the Uber jar is uh, is uh, we use a pl plugin called Shared Plugin, and you know it, it's just boilerplate. I don't worry much about uh, what it does, you know, I, I just bring that into uh, my project and it creates an Uber, Uber job. Okay. So, so, if you look at it, you know, this this is the part. Uh, so, so, under mm -hmm. plugins, you know, if you basically paste this code and uh, if you uh, yeah, that, that's all you need. You just paste that code in and then you will have... What do you need you know, this for? That data nu nucleus thingy? Sorry? What do you need that data nucleus thingy for? Data nucleus? Down below. Come down. Okay. After the Maven plugin, there's some... Uh, come down. Oh, still further down? Further down, yeah, this one. I have... I have no idea. I, okay. I I just take this whole plugin and put that in. That's all I do. All right. Okay. Gotcha. So that that gives you an over job. Okay. So if you go to target folder, mm -hmm. uh, you will you will see that you know this this is a jar file. This this is your code uh, packaged into a jar. But mm -hmm. if you look at the size of this, this is like uh, you know 31 kilobytes. And if you look at the size of this, you are looking at 93 megabytes. So this will have all the source code. Uh, I mean, all the uh, Spark dependencies. Uh, it'll also have this Postgres dependencies that that are needed for running this example. So, so, so that's all. So, so what we can do is in, uh, to move uh, further to, in order to uh, uh, develop more features into app this application. We can just start off this with uh, start off with this POM XML and things like that. You know, have this as the starting point, and then build from that point onwards. Okay. 
so so that's about compiling right and in order to run uh, i i need to have postgres running on this and i also need to have kafka running on this so i guess uh, when the machine starts postgres starts by default i can just check that uh, check to see if it is running So yeah, I do see that Postgres is running. Uh, it's running. So that's the uh, Postgres program that's running. And uh, since I have one external IP, uh, I can actually connect to that Postgres instance from from my laptop. You know, this I'm just running this from my laptop. So. Uh, well, I just uh, put this external IP that I have for that instance on Google Cloud. So if you look at the properties of this connection, so that's the host. So that's the uh, external IP of that host on Google Cloud. And this is the default port, uh, and I have not changed the default port on Postgres. So if you connect to that port, and it will connect as user BDC user. Uh, that's the user I have configured on that uh, Postgres instance. And I just have st you know, stored the password in this connection already. So, so if, you, if, you, if I say connect, uh, it should connect to that database. Uh, since since uh, if we uh, do not have the public uh, the external IP, then you'll have to run this tool right on that instance, is it? No, uh, if we don't have the well, everything will be assigned an external IP. Uh, what what we have is uh, a static external IP with, with that Correct. instance. So, so uh, if you if you uh, if, if you don't have a static external IP, uh -huh. what's going to happen is when the machine starts up, it gets assigned an external IP. Oh, okay. So I can still get and, that. And, uh, you, you, well, yeah, the only hassle is, you know, when, whenever you, sh you shut down and restart, you might get another one. Changes, and then if you want to connect from PG admin, uh, you just need to edit the properties and change that. Yeah, gotcha. Got it. Yeah. So it doesn't give you a, sta a static IP. That's the only thing. Oh, oh yes. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. I, what I meant is static external IP. Yeah. Got it. Okay. So, so on the machine properties, I should be able to get the external IP that was assigned at the time that it started. Right, right. So, so, okay. so when you actually go here, uh, you look at the if you look at this page you will see the new assigned ip here under this okay. okay all these machines are down so they, ah. they don't have assigned external ips right when they come up they will be assigned okay but if okay. i bring this instance down since i have, I have purchased mm -hmm. the static ip even if i bring this down i'll see this it number. will still be there just for this case Okay. Okay. So, so I can connect to the database and uh, schema. I have I have two tables. I think this test table. I don't remember what I set this up as the owner of this. So I can. Okay, I think I don't have permissions on test table though, but, but this table I have permissions on. So, uh, so if I run that, I, I mean, I would get something back. So this is from a previous run. Um, mm. So you have a, a key and a value. 
So, so, so in this example, program is just uh, throwing key and value read from Kafka, and it's also putting the partition ID, so the, uh, the partition number that it read the message from. So these are things that it's, it's actually uh, inserting into uh, you know the table. So what I what I'll do is I'll just truncate this table. So that we can run this fresh. Okay, so if I run this, I, I'm not sure if this is auto comment, but uh, I think truncate should uh, something we can roll back truncate. Yeah, I'm not sure of that. Let, let me run it as well, just in case. I'm sure it's auto comment. So, so, so that's uh, you know we just cleaned up the table, in the database, and now uh, so Postgres, as you saw, you know it ran by itself. Right? Uh, when 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 you install Postgres and configure and stuff like that, uh, it, by default it it actually is, uh, starts up when the machine starts up. Uh, but Kafka is not so. You know, you need to explicitly start the Kafka servers. So I don't see any Kafka process running. And for running, for starting Kafka, I have the commands here. Um, so before before we go there, you know, I, I just need to uh, tell you that. Uh, I would run Kafka as a user Kafka. So, so I have a user ID called Kafka and on this machine. So what I'll do is sudo su Kafka. So I will, so as you can see, you know, now this ID uh, is Kafka. So if I say ID, it will say, user ID goes by the name Kafka. And so, I mean, uh, I, I, I installed Kafka on this uh, as user Kafka. So that's the reason why I uh, issue it as uh, Kafka. And I, I have the instructions for, you know, setting up, adding a new user, you know, and then installing and all that. So it, it's just a few steps, you know, it's not going to take a long time long time. So once I do that, if I if I just do the last, I have I have just uh, Kafka installed uh, in the home directory of this. And I need to bring your attention to this. We discussed this last time, but I, I, I'll just repeat this. You know, if you go to server.properties, so this is one thing that you need to change. Uh, if you have a static external IP, you'll do it only once. Otherwise, uh, you, you'll have to do it whenever you start your machine. So uh, th there are there are these like uh, things called listeners. And so listeners are, uh, you know, th th this, th this set of, uh, this is for inter-broker communication. Broker is, you know, one Kafka instance, uh, one Kafka pro uh, server process. Think of that as a daemon process that's running. Uh, and since this is a cluster solution, you will have as many brokers running as there are, uh, uh, you know, uh, nodes in the cluster. And so you need to set that, and you need to uh, set advertised listeners as well. So this will use external IP, and uh, I have put the external IP in. I just need to mention this so that when you uh, Install this for the first time. You have to make sure advertised listeners will have external IP. 
Uh, Kumar, uh, I uh, in uh, in the listeners uh, thing, uh, yeah. which listener you wanted us to change? You said it will be static, and uh, if there is a change, then we need to update it. Is what you were mentioning, right? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, so, so, so if I go to server properties again, uh -huh. let's take a look at that again. So one listener is the the first one, which is on the the first one yeah, the for inter broker communication that doesn't need. Uh -huh. uh, so that's Correct. within the domain, right? So they only need the internal IPs, so, and okay. internal IPs on your Google Cloud will not change. Okay. Uh, yeah, this will not be changed. That will not change. Yes. Okay. You you will still need to change it to whatever internal. IP which uh, is given once, to so, your so instance of the machine. Uh, so this, when you create a machine once. on Google Cloud on Correct. your account, it will yeah. give you an internal IP. So you'll have to go ahead and change it to. Yeah, yeah, that uh, agreed, uh, Ranjini. That, that I got it. So yeah. the other one which I couldn't understand is uh, the use of this advertised uh, listener and uh, uh, do we need to change the. Uh, advertised listeners. So, so in, in a cluster solution, you know, on, on each. Uh, node where this runs, mm -hmm. uh, you will actually put listeners as the internal IP of the machine on which mm -hmm. this is running, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, look at it this way you have the same instance of Kafka config sitting on each of those machines, mm -hmm. and you will actually have. Uh, in the Kafka config of that local uh, of that specific machine, you need to actually change this to internal IP, and then you need to change advertised listeners to external IP in that machine. Okay. Does that make sense? I mean, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, and, and on this particular change instance, changes are uh, thing. This in this particular instance, yeah. we have one machine uh, which is acting as one cluster with one node, right? Yeah, this is. Uh, yeah, this is uh, one is node the, is, instance. Yes. Yeah. What? Would you have a possibility that you actually run it on multiple clusters? No. Uh, we can because I mean for Kafka itself, Kafka itself doesn't need too many, uh, but we may need more Spark instances. Mm -hmm. So, so what we may end up with is, is something like this: we may need a five or ten node Spark cluster. Okay. Uh, I'm I'm talking about you know a production system like for our testing yeah. we don't we're not going to use ten nodes. I mean, no, no, I'm talking about a production instance. Yeah, yeah, a production instance. You know, you'll you'll have let us say a ten node uh, cluster, and you will actually uh, commission all of them to run Spark. But Kafka itself may be running on three nodes or or four nodes. Uh, for, for Kafka, that should be enough. I mean, okay. Kafka will just grab the messages from somewhere and hand it over to the consumers. That's all it does. And right. Kafka will not need too much of uh, okay. yeah, processing power and all that. So, I mean, as long as you are using it only as a message queue, you don't need too many. So, so. So what we can do is, you know, you can have three machines, and for the for uh, each of the topics that we have, we can have uh, maybe uh, three. Uh, it, it's good to have. Uh, so if if you have, uh, let us say, uh, a four CPU machine. You know, let us say uh, you would want to use uh, two of those CPUs for Spark uh, on each of those machines. So you'll have two uh, 
exit your resource park running on each machine mm -hmm. and what you will need to do is uh, so if you have a 10 uh, 10 node cluster you're you're looking at let's say 20 executors and and if you have four kafka instances you you may define a topic that has uh, 20 partitions and and if you actually uh, do this so it it will make sure you know it, it will have like five partitions on each node so 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 you'll have 20 partitions and 20 executors and uh, that will make sure that all the executors have at least one partition to, to go to okay okay so so that's uh, that's about kafka config you know there's only one line edit that you need to do you know if, if you don't have a static uh, external IP. Uh, but, but if you know if, if you are doing a, a production deployment you'll make sure you'll have static ips and all that and you're not going to change this whenever you input your machine right okay so so let's start this so before uh, before you start the Kafka broker, you need to start something called Zookeeper. And, you know, the role of the Zookeeper and all that, you know, uh, you can actually uh, look up the documentation. What, what Zookeeper does is, you know, it makes sure, uh, you know, it, it makes sure, you know, that uh, it, it basically keeps track of all the brokers. And if the broker is... Yeah, we covered it last time. Yeah, yeah. So, so let, let's not go uh, into what Zookeeper does. So I, I'll just start Zookeeper first. And so it's, it's taking the default. We, we haven't changed anything in the Zookeeper properties file. So if I run... So I have something running there. And once that is running, I, I'll just run the Kafka server. So if I just say, yes, I have two Java processes running. Uh, Uh, I'm not sure which one switch so um, yeah it, it takes in a lot of arguments here so it's difficult to track okay so that, so that's the second one from there onwards. So, so okay. as the first part, so this is Zookeeper that's running and this is the second uh, instance that is running. So, so we have Kafka servers running. And I mentioned Kafka tool, right? Uh, we, so I'm, I'm also running Kafka tool on my local machine. I'm uh, on my Windows machine. So what I have is uh, when you have something like this, you will just set up uh, you can add a new connection. Uh, you could uh, give some name for the new connection. And Kafka version, what I have is 10. I can give a name. Zookeeper host. So this is running on on the cloud. So so that's the IP. And 
and that's the default port i have not changed it and we have not enabled any security on the server side so it's just plain text so the other security protocols are ssl uh, sasl plain text and sasl ssl so sasl refers to authentication and after that authentication happens you can have plain text going back and forth or even those uh, messages can be encrypted by ssl so those are the options you have and so let's do a test <clears throat> okay so it says it should connect successfully and i mean what i have here is the same thing i just uh, use this to create a new connection connecting to the same thing and so if you look at it the brokers are running on this we have only one instance of this broker. If you have a cluster, you will actually see as many brokers here as uh, there are on the cluster. And topics, I, I don't have any topics at this time. So, so what I'll do is I, I can act, I can actually create a topic here. So, for our application, we we need a topic called test topic. Um, so if, if you look at the Kafka readme file, so you, you have the instructions here on how to run it on Google Cloud. So you you cd into that folder which i have done and then to run the uh, to run the consumer this is the command that i will do to run the uh, producer that would be the command and uh, and all of them involve a topic called test hyphen topic that's a topic name uh, that's a kafka topic name so we need to create a topic called test topic And let us say we are looking at three partitions. And I set the replica count as one. You know, on a production system, you may set it as two or three. So, so we have a test topic now. And it has three partitions. And there is no data on it yet. Um, so we, we we can set this to a string you know if you, if you want to actually see what messages are, are on the topic but this is a very useful tool actually you know it's, it's uh, not from the kafka community but i uh, i forgot uh, who built this i think airbnb or so somebody you know built this uh, you can actually uh, review the messages here. And those are the partitions. <clears throat> so if I refresh this, it will go back and tell me there are no messages. So that zero there is, is about the number of messages we have on the topic. Okay, so let me go back here. Um, I think I had, I had saved the, I need to edit that line a little bit. Uh, and what I'll do is, I'll, so, so I have the, that the thing edited out. So I have printed out the home directory name and all that stuff. So the first one will give me the consumer. Uh, I can start this up. So that it keeps running. Okay. 
So this is streaming context started. That means the consumer is waiting for messages. <clears throat> and I'll need another window to actually put some messages uh, on the topic. So I'll start another SSH shell. So to, uh, to run the producer, uh, <clears throat> so if this example, you know, produces, you know, you, you can actually uh, make this produce any number of messages. You know, it, it, it just uses some random number generator to create a message and post it on, on the, on the cloud. I mean, on, on the topic. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll, I'll run this that creates just about thousand messages. And uh, so that's what this does. Okay, so, so this ran very quickly, you know, it actually, uh, <clears throat> That looks strange. It cannot be that many milliseconds. But anyway, it, it finished very quickly. Uh, now, this must have processed also. So what, what we can do is we can run this uh, and see if we can see any messages at all. So there are messages now that flowed in. So if you look at... Uh, So that, yeah, so those thousand messages are in. So, uh, and uh, I'm also reading the partition from which uh, the message was read. I am, I am putting that as a part of uh, the database insert. So, so th those are the random messages. Now, so that's about the, the consumer keeps running, you know, it keeps waiting for uh, messages on the topic. And whenever there is, uh, there is a new set of messages, the consumer will pick it up uh, in whatever polling time interval it is set to poll. And then uh, the messages are in. So if we should see 2000 for this now because we ran the producer two times. Where are you actually doing the insert? Where? Inside the Kafka example, is it? Uh, inside the Kafka example. Yeah, we can take a look at the code. So, so what I'm doing here is uh, in the consumer code. Oh, yeah, we, uh, we saw it here. Yeah. We, I, I saw it later too. Yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, this is all the code that, that there is, right? So Yeah, sorry, I forgot about that. Uh, I'm also writing the output to a file. Uh, anyway, uh, so that's that. So, so I'm I'm creating an insert mm. statement here, etc. Right. So it's actually running that uh, insert here. <clears throat> so so what this does is this uh, this the, the streaming context will produce a stream of RDDs, right? And right. So what you're doing here is stream that for each RDD, you do this. So that means, you know, uh, take the RDD and run this logic. This is what uh, it's doing. Uh, so first, first you, you have to make sure that uh, you, you, you have to keep track of offsets. Uh, so what it means is, 
the consumer may have uh, crashed or gone down or you know sh has, or has been shut down right but the producer may keep putting messages there and the consumer should start from where it left off earlier so that's why you have to uh, make sure you keep uh, track of offsets and uh, and, and then for, for each partition within the RDD, you know, uh, this is being done. You know, this, this is some code that we need to look at closely. Uh, and <clears throat> so you can get the partition ID and, uh, you know, this is a, there's some print that's going on. Uh, Anyway, so, so, so this is the... So the, the, so the listener mm -hmm. instantiates itself and runs across multiple partitions, right? Uh, yeah, well, the, the uh, Kafka cluster part, uh, provisioning a Kafka cluster, you know, that there may be uh, something more than just uh, running it. You know, the zookeeper will need to know what are the brokers and mm -hmm. the brokers uh, will have to be tied up i need to look at that so the okay. single node instance is very easy right uh, okay. so so somehow these uh, these uh, the zookeeper will tie all these brokers together and then they say they all are, are one so so what happens is if one of the nodes is down mm -hmm. uh, the zookeeper will make sure your messages go get routed to another broker and uh, the way you have uh, set your replicas and things like that you know uh, if, if your replica set is one you know then you are in trouble if your uh, replicas uh, count is more than one then mm. the node goes down you know it will make sure that it will route you to another uh, router uh, right, I was actually thinking more in terms of that RDD for each that you you have okay. done, right? I, I was wondering how that works across multiple nodes. Oh, oh that, that that's the Spark thing, right? So it yeah, that's the Spark thing. Yes. Yeah. So I mean, uh, this this whole thing runs in the Spark context. So for each RDD, so that. Uh, when it says uh, each RDD, what it's talking about is the RDD that is chopped off by the consumer. So mm -hmm. the, if the consumer is pulling once every second, all the elements that came in all the partitions, that, right? So that will mm -hmm. form uh, within that one second will be that RDD. Oh, oh, okay. So it's across all... Uh, across all the uh, nodes in the cluster, yes. Ah, I see. Okay. So, so na they are naturally uh, distributed already, right? And mm -hmm. uh, and Spark itself works on partitions. So yes, it does. So, so it'll it'll make an RDD where uh, each partition is, is naturally the the messages read from the Kafka partition. Oh, so all the work is actually done by the zookeeper and the brokers. So we, you're saying it doesn't have to be worried about in the in the right. spark. Of yeah, the, there are, there's no shuffling involved here. The, the message mm -hmm. okay. on a cluster will stay in that cluster. I mean, okay, okay. the messages that go on a node will stay in that node. Okay. Okay, got it. Okay, so, so, so this is just a basic uh, streaming Kafka and mm -hmm. Spark is involved, mm -hmm. and so the the next step we have is is to actually uh, create something similar with structured streaming. With with a structured streaming, right? Right. Okay. Uh, structured streaming will have some uh, uh, Spark SQL. Uh, semantics and all that stuff. You can actually run uh, your queries on that. So, so once uh, 
uh, well, for, for each, uh, well, we need to look at some examples there, you know, like when the, uh, when the, the stream is handled this way, the stream actually updates an unbounded table and then uh, in a loop uh, with, with certain, uh, in a certain time interval, you know, the, uh, you, you, you repeatedly uh, run a query on that unbounded table and the results are actually updated into some external table. So, so mm -hmm. those are the things we need to look at. So I think that will be our, uh, our next. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm good with this. Uh, even though I asked you some basic stuff today, I'm, I'm fairly good with this. Good. Okay, so so what? Okay, uh, I think I can stop recording, right? So, yeah.